All right, welcome to our Bible study. Today is August 18th. And as you can see, our lesson today is um, from Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. Shall we pray before we, uh, we begin? Heavenly Father, we come into thy presence and we uh, look upon thee because we need you. The world needs you. We need the Lord. Most of all, we need to hear your word because in your word, is the truth. Your word is you that have come down from heaven and we have seen your glory. But the world rejected you. They love darkness more than light. And now as we are seeing this world turn into darkness more and more every day, we ask you, Lord, to shine in our hearts. Draw us to yourself, break us, free us from the kingdom of Satan, and bring us into thy presence. May it be that we will meditate upon your, your word tonight as we look into our lesson, and you will bless us as we uh, seek to um, find you, as we seek you in your word. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So today, um, I would like to um, start a lesson, maybe a three-part lesson, which is called Fourfold Prayer of Paul. But before we get there, I'd like to read Philippians chapter 3 from verse 8 to 12 as we are looking into the Word of God. Philippians 3, 8 through 12. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. The righteousness which is of God by faith. Verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might, I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of, Christ Jesus. I would like for you to look with me in the book of Philippians as I will be speaking to you from the third chapter of this book. I especially would like for you to turn to the scripture, because I'm going to be starting to read from verse 1 of Philippians 3. And I will re be referring to all of these verses one by one tonight. And the Lord willing, we will get down to verse 12 in a couple of weeks. Here's our subject. I'll be speaking to you on the subject of four, a fourfold prayer. A fourfold prayer. Now... I think that is a very important message. I believe that uh, it will be helpful to you if you will listen to the entire lesson with us and follow along with us in your Bible. If you will look at verse 1 of Philippians 3, we see that the Apostle Paul is a man of one message. 
he doesn't have multiple messages for multiple people. He's a man of one message. He said in verse 1, Philippians 3, 1, to keep writing, that means, and preaching, to you the same thing is not grievous to me. That means I don't mind at all preaching to you the same message. It is for your good that I preach the gospel to you again and again and again. Paul was a man of one message. He said, I am determined to know nothing among you except save Jesus Christ and him crucified. We preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul said, God sent me not to baptize. Do you know that? God sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel in 1 Corinthians 1.17. So that is the first thing we know in Philippians 3.1. Paul said, I'm a man of one message, and I don't, remind, I don't mind repeating it over and over again. It is not grievous to me at all, he says. It is good for you. And it is glorifying to our God. You know, a lot of people try to bring new messages. They try to change things up. They try to excite people by putting their philosophies and their vocabularies and their psychologies and philosophy into the sermon. But Paul is very clear. I don't mind talking to you about Christ and him crucified over and over again. I didn't come here to baptize anyone. I came to preach the gospel. He has one message. Now watch verse 2. Verse 2 of Philippians 3. I know today that we hear people say, well, don't criticize other denominations. Don't talk about other preachers. Don't call people by name. But Paul did that. Look what he says in verse 2. Now listen to him. It is strong language. It is very strong that I probably would not use, perhaps. But look what he's saying. He's talking about the covetous. He's talking about the greedy. He is talking about fame-seeking preachers of this day. False prophets, he calls them. He calls them a stronger word in this passage. In verse 2, he calls those covetous, greedy, Fame-seeking preachers, he says, beware of dogs. In other words, he is talking about these false preachers who glory in the flesh. He said, these people put emphasis, now listen to me, listen to the scriptures. He says, these people put emphasis on ceremony circumcision, law, human works, and baptism, and not on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our Lord called them false prophets. The apostle called them in another place, merchandisers of souls. They play with your souls. They buy and sell. Here, he calls them dogs. Beware, he says, of these dogs. Now, Paul has one message, and he calls out the false teachers. And in verse 3, Paul says, But we are the two circumcision. What does he mean? Here's what he's saying here. 
He says, we are the true circumcision. Here's what he's saying. These men are not men of faith. He's saying, they are not men of the gospel. They are not men of Christ. They are not even men of the true circumcision or the true Israel or the true faith. He says, we are the true circumcision. We are of the true faith. He gives three marks. Three marks in verse three. Very important. He says, we worship God in spirit. Not in form. Not in ceremony. Not in processionals, not an outward show and gimmicks. He says, we worship God in the spirit. Can you see spirit? Then he says, we worship God from our hearts. We worship God in spirit. Our Lord said, in John 4, 24, God is a spirit, and they who worship God must worship him in the Presbyterian church. No, God is a spirit, and they who worship God worship him in spirit and truth. We worship God in the spirit, not with trinklets, not with signs, not with ceremonies. But we worship God from the heart in the spirit. That's the first thing that he calls out in verse 3, the three marks. The three marks of those people that are in the true faith, true circumcision, circumcision of the heart. One, worship God in the spirit, not with gimmicks, not with showmanship, not with uh, fashion shows. Worship God in the spirit. Secondly, we are the true circumcision who rejoice, who rejoice in Christ Jesus. We don't rejoice in our works. We do not rejoice in our baptism. We rejoice in Christ. Who is he? He is the son of God. What did he do? He came to this earth to bear our sins in his body on the tree. Why did he do it? He did it in order that God might be just and justifier. Where is he now? He is at the right hand of God. You see, we rejoice in Jesus Christ. He is our righteousness, not your pastor. He is our sanctification, not your baptism. He is our redemption, not the blood of goats. He is our wisdom and not your elders. He is our acceptance with God and is not your rituals and your Righteous deeds. He is our acceptance with God. Jesus Christ is the Lord. So you see, if we are of the true faith or of the true circumcision, number one, we worship God in the spirit. Number two, we rejoice in Christ Jesus because of who he is and what has he done and where he is today. Thirdly, in verse 3, 
we see the third mark. He says, we have no confidence in flesh. We that are of the true circumcision, we that are of the true faith, we have no confidence in the flesh. We don't put our confidence in human prophets or human preachers. We don't put our confidence in human organizations. We do not put our confidence in even ourselves. Our confidence is in Christ and only Christ, Christ alone. Okay? Now we come to verse 4 in Philippians chapter 3. Paul says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he has whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. This is what he means in verse 4. He says, if he, any of you feel like you can find acceptance with God by, the, by your own righteousness, and that acceptance with God is to be gained by heritage or tradition or human works, I would be way ahead of you. Way ahead of you. That's what he's saying. If acceptance with God is what we do with our flesh, in flesh, he says, I am way, way, way ahead of every one of you. If you think that God Almighty will look upon a man and accept him and receive him because of who he is or because of his background or because of the works that he has done, then Paul says, I have done more than you. If anything can be gained by human effort, Paul says, I would have complete security in it because I've done way, way more than any one of you. Why does he say that? Why does he say that? Well, he says it and listen to him in verses 4 through 6, Philippians 3. He starts telling us that what he is and what he has done, and at the end he will say all of this doesn't mount up to anything when it comes to be accepted by our Savior. Listen to what he says. He says, I've been circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel. In other words, this circumcision, when I was eight days of age, it put me into the covenant of Abraham, made me, recognized me as one of Abraham's seed, one of Abraham's people. That's the first qualification. Not only that, he says, but I am of the tribe of Benjamin. That tribe was called Beloved of the Lord. And that was the tribe that gave Israel their first king, King Saul. King Saul came out of Benjamin. I was of the tribe of Benjamin. Not only that, he said, but I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I am not a half-breed. My daddy was an Hebrew, and my mother was an Hebrew. He says, I am pure Hebrew. Not only that, Paul said, but I was a Pharisee. I was a leader in religion. I have my credentials. I have my PhDs. I have them all in theology. I was an orthodox teacher in religion. I was doctrinally, morally, ceremonially, 
ritualistically and legally sound. How many people can say that? Not too many. No man could find fault with me, he says, concerning the law, I was blameless before human courts. Oh, the Supreme Court loved them. He was blameless. He was a member of it. Not only that, he says, but I was full of zeal and blameless before all men. Now, if any of you, he says, you think you have more than this, I got more than all of you, he says. And if you want to brag about how many professions you have made and how many sermons you have preached and how many songs you have written and who your daddy was and who was your grandfather and grandmother, and you want to brag about what denomination you're from and how you formed a denomination and what you've done for God and all of that, Paul says, I will top everything you present. That's what he's saying. I was circumcised the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin, and I am an Hebrew of an Hebrews. And he says, concerning the law, I was blameless, and I was Pharisee. I was zealous before the law. I was blameless. Now watch the next verse, verse 7. But what things were gain to me, now listen, please, the things that were gain to me, those I counted loss for Christ. In verse 7, but all of these religious duties, he says, and all of these religious works, which were so important to me, and there was a day in which they were important to the Apostle Paul before he met Christ, before he learned the gospel. This ritualism and legalism, this ceremonialism was so important that it was his hope for heaven. It was his hope for salvation. It was his hope for acceptance with God. He said, this was so important to me. These things were gain to me, but, 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 but once I was changed. But what I once counted gain, I now count as nothing. I count but loss that I may win Christ and be found in him. In other words, he says, when the Holy Spirit opened my eyes, and that is what must be done, whether a man is in religion or in sin, whether a man is in church or in the world, the Holy Spirit has to open his eyes. Salvation comes by revelation. It doesn't come by education. It does not come by argument and debate. Salvation comes by revelation. He says, when the Holy Spirit opened my eyes, and I learned what sin really was. Sin, my friends, is a nature. Sin, my friends, is a principle. Sin, my friend, is an evil heart. When the Holy Spirit opened my eyes and I learned what sin really is, I not only learned what sin really is, but I learned that even my righteousness in God's sight, not in man's sight, that which is highly esteemed among is an 
abomination to God. He learned that. That which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination to God. He learned that. When God opened his eyes, he opened his eyes and he saw all of his credentials are an abomination to God. Luke 16, 15. But Saul of Tarsus says, I learned that my righteousnesses were filthy rags in God's sight. And in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. In the flesh no man can please God. He learned that. I learned that all have sinned, even the Pharisees. I learned that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, even in Hebrew. I learned that all have sinned. And the only righteousness that God would accept is Christ's righteousness. The only atonement that God Almighty will receive or look upon with favor is Christ's blood. Not the animal blood of the Old Testament or the tabernacle or the temple. The only way of salvation and redemption is by God's grace. He learned that when God opened his eyes. He said, when I saw that I not only counted my works and my zeal to be loss, not only loss, those things they, that were gained to me, but I look upon all of my fleshly religious enterprises, works, efforts, obedience, and morality to be so much garbage and rubbish. I not only counted them but loss, but I counted them Dung for Christ's sake. Manure for Christ's sake. God, my friends, doesn't save preachers. My friends, God saves sinners. God doesn't save Pharisees. He saves sinners. God doesn't save religious people. He saves sinners. God doesn't save respectable people. He saves sinners. Paul later wrote in 1 Timothy 1.15, this is a faithful saying, and it is worthy of accept acceptation by all people, that Jesus Christ is come, now listen, into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Now you remember something, and you listen very carefully to what I'm about to say, please. Please listen carefully. And we will end the lesson in a minute after this. But I want you to listen very carefully to what I'm about to say. I know a little bit about this subject. Now listen, the great problem of preaching is not getting lost people saved. That's not a problem, my friend. There is no problem in that. Did you hear me? The great problem of preaching is not getting lost people saved. That is no problem. Find me a lost man, and I will preach the gospel to him, and he will be saved. Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. He died for the ungodly. He died for the sinners. There is no problem in getting lost people saved. But here's the kicker. The problem of preaching, now listen, is getting religious people lost. That is the problem of preaching. We got to get the religious people lost. A man will never be saved until he is lost. He will never be found until he is lost. 
He will never receive grace until he is guilty. He will ne never be found until he is lost. He will never be saved until he is a sinner. And he will never be robbed of in, in the righteousness of, sorry, and he will never be robed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ until he is naked, until he has been stripped of every fig leaf apron of his own works, merit and righteousness. He will never be robed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ until he is naked. All of our fig leaf aprons, all of our works, they have to be gone. Paul, having turned loose of all of his confidence in himself, having given up all of the claim on God through the works of the law, having looked upon the mercy and grace of God in Jesus Christ, the apostle lays down fourfold prayer. This is what I want to talk to you about next week. I hope I've gotten your attention. I hope I've, I have interested you in what I am going to say next week. Here's a man who had been where some of you are, raw, robed in self-righteousness, building upon a false foundation, hiding in a religious refuge, trusting in your works and your merits to find acceptance with God. And you have never found any lasting peace. You have never found any real joy. You have never found any real communion with God. You just feel like a whitewashed tombstone or a whitewashed Pharisee, clean on the outside, but full of extortion and excess on the inside. Well, here is an example, my friends. Here's an example. He said, if you think you have whereof to trust in the flesh, I can do more than you. He says, what was gained to me, I counted but loss. I counted but rubbish, garbage, that I may come to a real saving knowledge of God Almighty in Jesus Christ, that I may win Christ. Here, my friends, is a self-righteous, moral, religious teacher who has been broken by the power of God to realize his guilt. A self-righteous, moral, religious teacher who has been broken by the power of Holy Spirit so he can put his trust in Christ. He has been brought down in the dust of guilt and repentance. And he sees himself in the need of mercy. Do you see yourself in the need of mercy? If you do, like Paul, he offers God a fourfold prayer. And Lord willing, we will get to that next week shall we pray heavenly father what a wonderful chapter we have in front of us we want to glorify you we want to worship you we don't want to cling on our good behaviors and righteous deeds and our morality break us so we can realize our guilt Bring us down in the dust of our guilt so we can repent. So we see ourselves in the need of you. We see ourselves in the need of mercy. Enable us, Lord, to pray 
like Paul. Because we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.